Yeah, and Gustav, could you explain the major group process that operates around the United Nations? It is, in many ways, a very ingenious uh, concept because all the major groups are also organized as non-governmental organizations. Now, the reason I'm saying that is that going back to the Charter itself, the Charter of the United Nations, it recognizes three uh, groups, three actors, the member states, of course, international organizations, and the non-governmental community. So, in order for anyone to be actually um, actively involved in the UN processes under General Assembly or ECOSOC, uh, the Economic and Social Council, you need to have a basic organizational system as a non-governmental organization. Uh, the major groups are nine, uh, as was stipulated and agreed to by Agenda 21 uh, in 1992 at the Rio conference. Uh, they are children and youth, women, farmers, indigenous peoples, the NGO community, local authorities, trade unions, private sector and the scientific community. Uh, now, actually all the uh, non-governmental organizations in the world can be part of that as long as they have uh, an organizational structure that is recognized qualitatively by the UN itself. Um, one thing is important to understand and that is that um, all civil society organizations are NGOs, but not all NGOs are civil society. And that is also the beauty of the major groups, because the major groups that employ, involves, for instance, uh, private sector, which is not of civil society, they are an NGO uh, uh, organization. For instance, through ICC, which is the International Chamber of Commerce. The same relates to the uh, local authorities. I mean, they're obviously uh, authority representatives, but they're organized through uh, organizations such as UCLG or, or ICLE. Now what do they do? Well they provide, they should be providing a basic service in order for the different groups that are part of the non-governmental community to be able to access the U UN. The major group system uh, is set up uh, through an organizing partner and each of the nine major groups have different ways of selecting and electing the organizing partner. But uh, the outset and organizing partner or partners because there are several now for each major groups do provide service for their own constituency. Uh, they do not speak on behalf of the uh, major groups, uh, but they speak for them and with them. But if you have a specialist uh, that can relate to a specific theme of the UN itself, that person and that organization should be found by the organizing partner and then speak in the context of his, his or her specialty. So the it, without going into great detail, because you can actually do that, uh, the major groups, I would say, provide a service for the greater non-governmental community, specified to each of the nine. And, and you at one point coordinated the, the NGO, or one of the organizing partners for one of uh, for the NGOs. H how did that operate, as, as an example? Um, I think the best, ex yes, I did actually uh, function as an organizing partner. Uh, for uh, the better part of 10 years uh, and um, at the time the system was set up that we were not an elected community and this was important because we were never allowed to speak on behalf of the NGOs. Um, I think it's important to understand that an organizing partner needs the support of his or, or her organization because it's not an honorary situation or a position that you can come and do a couple of times a year. It's a full-time job. And I had the support with the budget of my organization. And back in 2004 and 5, when the Commission on Sustainable Development uh, had uh, one of the themes as uh, uh, the habitat issues, uh, slum dwellings, etc., uh, my organization, with the other uh, NGOs uh, that belonged to the, the uh, major group at the time, we identified key organizations in the world that had expertise on this issue. And we found uh, a very vocal organization in Bombay. And we brought the chair of this organization to the CSD, and he provided expertise that none of the, of the other NGOs or the member states had. And I remember, I remember he, 
he, his issue came up in one of the plenaries and I said to him, you speak on this tomorrow. And then he said to me, I'm sorry, but I can't do that because I am semi-literate. So what we did was he actually told us his story, what he wanted to say. We wrote it into UN context. He memorized it with small holding cards and he made a difference because his knowledge was a lived knowledge and all the delegations actually got up and gave him a, a standing ovation when he was finished. I think that was the best kind of service I could have done to the NGO community on that particular aspect. And um, can you think of a, any example or example or two uh, where one of the major groups has had a really significant impact um, on the process? Um, let me take two <clears throat> from two different parts of the UN. One would be the Rio process, the other one would be UNEP because the UN Environment Programme also has the same system with the major groups. Uh, at the beginning of this century, UNEP had taken on uh, itself to further develop uh, uh, the chemical issues relating to the chemical conventions. Um, we had been able to bring in uh, organizations in the world that worked on chemical issues and they had expertise that none of the member states had. So, to make a long story short, they were so good at, at, um, they were so good at presenting their issue in terms of, of understanding of this complexity of, the com of chemicals that the two member states that were actually chairing this particular part asked them to write the, the uh, basic documents. So this was a, an example of where expertise from the NGO community actually not only uh, informed the debate but actually wrote what was adopted. And the other, pro the other example is uh, in the run-up to Rio and the ocean area where um, you may remember at a, at a conference that was uh, sponsored and organized, uh, sorry, sponsored by, by Monaco and, and organized by Stakeholder Forum. Uh, where you also had a role at the time, we brought in uh, Greenpeace. And Greenpeace uh, had then a strong expertise on the oceans and they ended up actually not only informing the Rio process but actually getting a lot of, of the final text on oceans into the outcome document. And I think this is an, again an example where top quality NGOs or organizations within the major group constituency can make a difference. Thank you.